Warning, the following video contains explicit language which may be offensive to some viewers or inappropriate for children. The content within this video is intended for mature audiences only. Hello and welcome to this video. Today's uh, Rabbits Podcast Breakdown is for Season 1 Episode 6, Strange Attractors. This is part 2 of the breakdown of this episode, so let's get into it. So, it looks like Yumiko didn't have access to that ROM. At least, not before it was dropped off at the gym. Did she have it modified somewhere earlier? Did somebody who knew her change the ROM without her knowing? I needed to find out how difficult it would be to not only program something like that, but to then install it into the ancient code that ran an arcade game from 1981. Now, I hope a friend of mine has a business in which he does arcade cabinets, claw machines, pinball machines, um, internet jukeboxes, and what have you. And I've helped him refurbish cabinets. Um, we played around with switching out motherboards and sister boards and stuff, but we never had any reason or inclination to deal with the actual software and firmware on the boards. In the late 80s, early 90s, um, Radio Shack had the little, like, simulated uh, logic boards type thing where you could program it and you could play things like Snake or Tetris, little 8-bit graphic games. Um, those were fairly complex they weren't like super hard that you just had to follow the directions really well now I have no idea how hard or how easy it would be to modify the logic board on a professionally made uh, board I imagine it's way more difficult than the things that you buy that were meant to be fooled with. Um, so uh, we will listen and find out together. It turns out it's almost impossible, but it could be done. I called a local game store. They restore old pinball machines and video games. I stop in every time I walk by to play whatever machines they have running on the sales floor. It's kind of like a rotating arcade, but the games are free. That is something that I've never come across in East Texas. Um, my last couple years in high school, there was a uh, computer store in a strip center, Carpers Cove, that the they built computers, they refurbished computers, did the whole everything state of the art for late 1980s. And the proprietor of the shop had a couple of video games for people to come in and play free, which is kind of interesting. And I imagine in lar your larger cities, you know, like Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Bryan College Station, San Antonio, places like that, you may actually still have places like that. I can't say for 100% sure, yes or no, but in, the, in concept anyways, it's pretty cool. And judging by Miles... Terry Miles is writing and stuff that as relatable as things are in this podcast I do 
think that he based this on something he encountered and or knows about something something he's familiar with I should say Two brothers run the place, identical twins, Frank and Dave. They're both tall, thinning hair, easy smiles, and they're always wearing some kind of cool vintage t-shirt. Vintage in the way that they bought it in the year it came out, not vintage in a pre-faded and available at Walmart sense. Dave was waiting for me when I arrived. I can honestly say that I have t-shirts that are forever old, I have a few t-shirts that are as old as my wife, um, which she she doesn't care for the shirts. I don't know if it's because they're as old as she is or but what's printed on them, but I understand the whole vintage t-shirt thing. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it's... Yeah, they're, they're kind of my go-to comfort t-shirts, like if I'm feeling sick or under the weather. Um, but as far as wearing them every day, probably not. Probably won't hold up. If I were to wear them every day, I think they would kind of fall apart. But that is, you know, that's neither here nor there in the, the, the overall plot of the story. Hi. You're the girl that plays Robotron. It's one of my favorites. Didn't we have to kick you out once because you wouldn't die? Like I mentioned on the phone, I was wondering how difficult it would be to modify a Stargate logic board. Now, the whole getting kicked out. Now, a friend of mine who lives up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, when we were kids growing up, we were in pay arcades and there was a couple times because he was that good at video games that I thought we were going to get kicked out because he was that good. But, you know, it, it boils back to the relatability of small things in the story, how they trigger memories and recollections, which is a testament to the writing. Can I see it? Uh, yeah, of course. And you claim it boots up as Defender 2. Yeah. I didn't think Williams released that title to arcades. Well, that's the rumor. I have a couple of calls into Williams, but I'm beginning to get the sense that there's really nobody left there who has any idea about this era. Yeah, internet's your best bet. That's what I thought. So, what do you think? Well, when it comes to modding these old games, switch a code is pretty easy. Just add in another cabinet, but actually getting in there and adjusting the ROM is complicated. Right. Requires some very old and very specialized equipment. Not to mention experience with these things. Okay, but it's possible. Sure, it's, I suppose it's possible, but... Could you do it? Me, no. No, that's not even close. Okay. But I could let you know if anything on that logic board has been altered, if you'd like. Really? Sure. Just leave it with me for a couple days. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, this section of the uh, story, I had completely forgot the deep. I knew, I remembered the 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 concept of her having to do this but I couldn't remember the details um so yeah it was interesting we got a mid show ad coming up we'll get we'll get, I'll skip through that so please bear in mind so Dave was looking into that ROM and I was trying to decide whether or not I should fly up to Alaska to see if I might be able to track down a clue to finding the place known as Arcadia. The place Jones referred to as a station, a kind of repository of clues or something. While I was considering a trip to Alaska, I received an alert on my phone. 
It was the breadcrumbs app. When the application originally showed up on my phone, there was a photo in the photo section of the interface. This time, there was something in the video section. It was blurry and had obviously been taken without the subject of the video's knowledge. Whoever was filming was filming from across the street. Through Some very serious peeping Tom crap going on here. A window using an extremely sharp zoom lens, probably sitting on a tripod or stabilizer of some kind. On the video, it was Yumiko at her desk, typing away on her laptop. Yeah, um, I think if I was to come across a video like that of somebody fil filming somebody I cared for, I would probably be, like, super creeped out about it, so. Hey everyone, my name is Terry Miles, and as most of you probably casts and making movies, but a miniseries called The Path. The Street. There we go. The video was short, about 11 seconds, but it ended with a screen capture. Zoomed in, you could read most of what Yumiko had been typing on her computer. I'm going to read that for you now. I've been finding increasing circumstantial evidence to support the fact that Hazel wasn't responsible for Emily's death due to Hazel pulling her along on a quest to win the game. Emily was a very strong player in her own right. She'd moved ahead and uncovered a big clue of some kind. And... I don't know... Because I... If I don't, I don't remember it ever explaining how these videos and stuff showed up. They just kind of do, which adds to the the unreality of the game, the supernatural aspects of the game. Um, plus, it's kind of cool not knowing. Sometimes not knowing is better than actually knowing or finding out. It's one of those things where you can explain too much. Um, I would say less is more. There are indications that she may have kept that clue to herself. That's what she was looking into at the time of her death. Was this a case of competition? Maybe Hazel didn't want her winning. Maybe she had to die. I found evidence that Hazel had been looking into certain cars' mechanical systems a few weeks before the accident. One of those cars was the exact model responsible for the death of Emily Masterson. I saw one of the gray ones while I was out for a run yesterday. I ran right at them, but when I got there, it was just a woman talking on the phone. But I know it wasn't. Was it? Am I losing my mind? I haven't slept in two days. I'm not... I can't remember what the scientific term or the technical term for it is, but there's a, a phenomenon that you see what you want to see. Not necessarily what's there. Or I believe it was Anis Nin who said it the best. Says we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And I think that's kind of apropos here. With not only this particular situation. But with the whole clues and not clues. And false leads and stuff. Throughout the game, I, I, I think this that the Anis Nin quote, quote is very apropos. I just. That's where it cuts off. 
It looks like Yumiko's research into video game mortality had led her deep into rabbits and the question of Hazel. I took a serious look into everything surrounding the death of Emily Masterson, but there really wasn't much there. Her family hadn't heard from her for a few years at the time of her death. She was considered something of an outsider, didn't have a lot of close friends. Her death in small town England in 1998 was barely reported. I've placed calls to everybody and anybody I could find who knew Emily Masterson. I'm still waiting to hear back. Yep. It's kind of interesting that the whole... As an outsider myself, um, the the things that, for for lack of a better term, that normies consider every day in every way, that the outsiders, the dropouts, pretty much Generation X, to be honest with you who make their own rules and do their own thing. So it's, it all boils down to the, this, you know, establishment, non-establishment type thing. Uh, the seeing beyond the status quo, I guess you would say. In the meantime, I needed to consider the possibility of a trip to Alaska to find out if there was anything waiting for me in Arcadia. Jones indicated the information on Arcadia was mostly speculation and patchy guesswork. The location, if it existed at all, appeared to be a mystery. Jones believed that it was real and that he'd been in contact with people who had seen it. He told me that most of the chatter surrounding Arcadia involved the aforementioned UFO abduction site stuff and native burial ground theories. Allegedly, according to a discussion about the Prescott Competition Manifesto in a deep web forum in 2011, players from 2, 4, and 5 had found markers or clues in a chest hidden in Arcadia. Important clues that allowed each of them to take a significant step forward in the game. I spoke with my friend Nick about taking a trip up north. And this is kind of interesting in and of itself. The whole looking for clues to find where other people found clues. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of like a boreous snake eating its own tail type thing. So we'll go, we'll continue on. You're going where? To the Tongass National Forest. And that's in Alaska. Mm-hmm. Alaska. Yeah. Wow, okay. I need to find some place called the Garden of Arcadia. It's supposed to be located in a part of the forest just north of Juneau. Okay, what makes you think this Garden of Arcadia has anything to do with Yumiko's disappearance? Okay, so although he told me that Arcadia is considered a relic from earlier incarnations of the game, Jones believes that our uncovering the information on that recording, how and when we did, is consistent with what might be considered a marker in the game. Okay. Like a signpost, indications a player should probably follow. Right, so basically a hunch. Basically. Yeah, and I've had a lot of hunches that paid off real good and a lot of hunches that kind of didn't. So, you know, it's a coin flip here. Okay, so how deep into this thing are you? I'm not sure. And this Jones, he told you to go up there to Alaska? Well... He told me not to, actually. Is he going with you? No. You know Alaska is far. Is it? And cold. Yes, I know. 
Okay. You sure? See, this whole... As somebody who lives in Texas, somebody living in Seattle saying that Alaska is far is extremely humorous to me simply because I live in Texas and I'm that much further away. And being in southeast Texas, I'm even further away. So, yeah, it's I, 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 I find that just kind of <laughs> just kind of humorous. Yeah, I'll pack a sweater. I used my air miles and booked a flight to Juneau, Alaska. When I stepped out of the airport, Jones was standing there, holding a sign with a picture of Bugs Bunny glued to it. Funny. A few yards away, an old red Plymouth Reliant sat idling. I started recording using my phone's voice recorder. What are you doing here? Here at the airport? Funny. I came up yesterday. Visit a friend. Jones. It's one thing if they come for you in a crowded city street. It's another thing if you're alone in the middle of the woods of Alaska. Are you recording? Yes. Is that your car? It's Cleopatra's. Is she the one staring at us? Yeah, that's her. Is she a player? Yes, I mean, she was. She lives up here? There are participants all over the world. And that one's name is Cleopatra? Cleo, yes. And I, li I like the use of pseudonyms, pseudonames, pseudonym, whatever. Um just simply because it makes life interesting and so many good authors over the years have used uh synonyms uh so it's just from a literary standpoint the uh use of pseudonyms is kind of cool just it's just a me thing She's going to take us to Arcadia. How far is it? Uh, about 35 miles. Cleo's driving? Oh, and Cleo suffers from aphonia. What's that? She's unable to speak. So we're going to be communicating through American Sign Language. Well, okay. Yeah, that, that I would be completely lost here because I know zero ASL. Um, though my sister-in-law speaks. And I believe my mother-in-law are both pretty good at it, so I don't know. I think it's a very valid form of communication. I've just been way too lazy to learn it, so yeah, it is what it is. Okay. okay. Cleo was small, short with frizzy yellow hair, not blonde, yellow. She wore horned rim glasses, a navy suit jacket that was too small, and a cream-colored men's tie. Although she was extremely fast when signing with her hands, Jones seemed to have no problem keeping up. Uh, Cleo's wondering if you've been to Alaska before. Should she be doing all that signing while she's driving? That... Every time I hear that part, I that is the first thought that creeps through my mind. In fact, when the first time I listened to it, I was just like, oh, God. They talk about people on cell phones try doing ASL while driving. That That's probably not safe. I've never been up here before. Oh, she wants to know if you know how to drive stick. You know manual transmission. Thank you. I know what drive stick means. And yes, my dad made me learn on a standard transmission when I was 15. What's she saying? She says you can't trust anybody who can't drive stick. <laughs> that, I, I forgot about that. That's interesting. Um, that can you be used 
euphemistically in many, many different ways in many different circles. We drove for 35 miles through some of the most beautiful country I've ever seen. Mountains, trees, streams, lots of deer and moose. We pulled over a few times to enjoy the view. It was incredibly peaceful and quiet. We checked into the hotel. Jones had booked us each a room. I told him I'd be paying for my own, but he'd already taken care of it. So I told him I was buying dinner and drinks. The whole knight in shining armor thing just does not compute with the Jones that we've uh, seen so far. We agreed to meet later, in the bar across the street. This place is great. I'll bet they don't hear that a lot. <gasps> they have shuffleboard. We're playing. Okay, but first, burgers and a drink? I'm starved. Absolutely burgers. And then, shuffleboard is happening. Are you still recording? Oh, yeah. We did end up playing shuffleboard. We each won two games. We also each had a few more than two drinks. I was in my room recording some notes for my narration when Jones knocked on the door. He wanted to talk. I come bearing wine. I accept wine of the red variety. Then we're in good shape. Plus, it's a twist top. Great. I think we've got some fine plastic glasses in the bathroom. Oh good, nothing but the best. And I have partaken of the fruit of the vine, or the drink of the vine, I should say, that in that particular manner before. Hey, should they still be called glasses if they're plastic? Good question. Cups, maybe? You know, cups sounds right. I had no idea at the time that I'd left my recorder running. Jones and I spoke about a lot of things. Music, video games, a bunch of television. Turns out we're both huge Doctor Who and Mystery Science Theater 3000 fans. As any decently intelligent person would be. I wanted to talk about so many things. My parents' death certificates, the names on the circle, the Hazel dossier, Yumiko's theory about Hazel as murderer, the reason Hazel, whoever they were, dropped out of the game just before they were about to win, the character associated with the image of a scary rabbit accompanied by the phrase, I want the future we were promised, not the future we deserve. But it turns out that Jones had something else he wanted to discuss. Your mother had you institutionalized when you were a kid. How do you know that? Why do you know that? I just know it. Oh. You just know it, do you? I had something similar happen to me. Really? You were institutionalized by your parents? I was thrown away by my parents. Same thing. I understand what it's like. It was something you remembered. Like a dream that was absolutely real, wasn't it? How do you know that? What was it? How do you know that? I experienced the same thing. Um... I had a memory. A memory of an event that nobody believed happened. How do you know? What happened? In your memory? We'll have to wait till I do the part three to find out what her memory was. Um, there are so many things that I am holding back to keep from spoiling that are in... Uh, re uh, revelations that are coming up in the next couple episodes 
and it's just I'm at that point where I want to what I want to say will spoil the surprise so until next time we'll call this good peace Children are.